recording so, the whole time? What? What's that? You weren't recording the whole time? <laughs> so Steve walked by and waved to the camera. Oh, yeah. When, uh, record anything? Jo yeah. Remember when Josh did that? <laughs> looking forward to seeing that a little bit yeah. more. Uh, let's, uh, let's pray, guys. Dear Heavenly Father, we, uh, we thank you for this, this time to come together here uh, as men to, to look towards your word and uh, to come back here after uh, the new year and to look towards your word and to grow uh, as men. Lord, grow us, sanctify us, and uh, draw us closer to you, uh, Lord, through this. And we pray for any uh, requests, any, any issues that may be going on in anybody's life that's here. I would just pray that you would touch them right now and uh, comfort them and may your word uh, illumine your truth to us and that we may use it in this world as we go about it, uh, our lives here. And we thank you for this time. We pray in your name. Amen. Amen. And uh, I wanted to look towards uh, Jonah tonight uh, and, and start a short series in this, this Bible study of the book of Jonah. And here you have Jonah, the four chapters of what would be considered a small book of the Bible, but by no means insignificant. Four chapters, someone might overlook this book or might think it's just about a fish. But it's far deeper than that. And in Jonah 1 here, it starts with a call, a divine call to God's prophet, Jonah. And before that call... You have, if you trace this back and you go to the end of the book of Jonah, I want to read the last verse of this book. You don't have to turn there, but I want to read it. It's, it's chapter 4 and verse 11. And this is God speaking. And he says, Should I not have compassion on Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons? who do not know the difference between their right and left hand, as well as many animals. And here at the end of this book here, that actually the last verse here sets up where this is coming from, this divine call to the prophet Jonah. The heart of God here, should I not have compassion on Nineveh? The great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the difference between the right and the left hand. And here you see God, the heart of God, here to see his people before they see him. The foreknowledge of God traced back from eternity past. Seeing the people that are in Nineveh, a wicked city, a great city puffed up in the flesh. But God sees here, he has his people in his city. And when we look at this story here, you see the city and God brings a miracle of revival. And how does he do it? He does it through his word. He didn't do it through things of trying to uh, bring people to himself by fleshly means. He did it by his divine word. God's word has power. And how can someone that in a nation and a person, one soul, many souls, 120,000 and a whole nation here, how can that person and that collective group here go from hating God and death and opposed to God to life? How can that happen? It's a divine work of God. And you have here this foreknowledge of God before seeing his people from eternity past here, before they were conceived. I see my people in Nineveh. And I'm going to use the most unlikely figure, someone that is not going to do it what would appear to be the right way. But I'm going to sovereignly bring about these events here to bring about salvation, to bring about my people, because they are my people. 
Should I not have compassion on Nineveh, Jonah, the, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons? And, and the picture is there, those were the youths, the number of the youth. You're saying that they did not know the difference between their right and left hand, but it's far greater than that. You have el the elderly, you have the middle-aged, you have the teenagers, you have here, you have the, his people. God knowing his people and seeing this here. And then he's going to use his prophet Jonah here. And he's going to set this up in his book and, and with an explanation, an owner's manual of how not to do it. And it's in the beautiful um, knowledge and divine conception of God to set it up this way. We would not design it this way to bring people to ourselves, or to if we if we were God, a bad example. But if as God, we would not say this is the right way to do it, if we're designing a plan for God, how to bring His people to Himself. God does the opposite of what we think as a human conception of going about things, and He and He uses here uh, an unlikely character. A prophet, a prophet that nobody really remembered of, of not great significance because of how he, he was doing it in not God's way. But you see, God accomplishes his purposes and his plans. When God has his people that he foreknew, when he had you before, he, before you were conceived, before you were in Christ, seeing you and orchestrating all the sovereign events to bring about your salvation, the family you were in, the, the time you would be born, the time you come, came to know the Lord. All of these things here can only be explained by a work of God, taking dead men to life. And there's a divine call here that goes out to Jonah because it's for divine purposes. This is not for just a small purpose or plan, because nothing is small in God's eyes. This is part of his grand eternal plan of redemption. And here you see this call here going to Jonah, and he says here in verse 1, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it. For their wickedness has come up before me. This has been elevated here, in essence, to the sight of God. The wickedness, the aroma of the wickedness here coming before the face of God. And here there's a divine, part of his divine plan and his divine inter intervention here to bring his people to repentance that they may change their ways and that they may call out to him running the total opposite away from God but he he is sovereign and he is going to bring about this transition and transformation here to go the other way and this call here to Jonah the word here of the Lord, the speech, the utterance of the existing one, the eternal God. Here, coming forth to Jonah. And this is a prophet here uh, that God is, is going to use. And Jonah knows his God, and he knows God's plans will be accomplished. But he is doesn't want to see these Gentiles come to know God. He wants to, he, it, it would be the last thing that he would want. But he knows that God, that because God is calling him here, that God, God is, is going to accomplish his purposes here. And Jonah's response here to the divine call here is one of disobedience. Does the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, 
is it easier, easier, easy instructions, arise, go to Nineveh. The picture there of getting up out of your stillness, out of your non, non-action or your low action. Arise, get up, stand forth here and go. Use these feet and these legs that I've given you to proclaim here, to go, to proceed forth to Nineveh. And Nineveh would be, the, is the, would be the great capital city here. And when you trace this back here, you see from the descendants of Noah here, Nimrod here, and this the establishment of this, this city, this what would be called a great city, and elevated here in the things of the world, but totally opposed to God here. And on the, the surface here, it seems that nothing would be accomplished. Like a flea going against uh, the largest wall of stone and, and that nothing here would be accomplished. But with God, all things are possible. So he says here, arise, go to Nineveh, the great city. And the instructions are because I have a plan. I have my people. And even if they're, and it's almost to the extent of if, if there was one person in Nineveh, Seeing the heart of God here to, to my people, that is my person. And this nation here, there are people in there that are mine. And my plans and my purposes will be accomplished. This city is a great city on, by what the world would say. But God is calling the people out of this great city, in this world here, that they may inherit the true city his eternal kingdom. And I want you to see that here, that what what was elevated in their eyes and with their passions and what they were seeking here in their worldly pursuits, God's heart and his grace and mercy, he should have wiped them off the face of the planet. But you see all throughout scripture here, his, his hand extended, his grace and his mercy, his love, so giving them breath and life and the door open for repentance turn from your ways and the bad news must be proclaimed first cry against it <laughs> cry against it proclaim pro- preach against it against these people for their wickedness has come up before me the graciousness and the mercy of God to send a prophet to them And Jonah does the opposite of what God tells him to do. But Jonah rose and rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And in this map here, I I put in in the handout here, you see this is... God's instructions are here to, to go from this general area to Nineveh. He says, arise, go to Nineveh. That distance is... Yeah. That's the task at hand. The instructions that I'm giving you here, proceed to Nineveh and proclaim. But Jonah does the opposite of this here. He arises and he goes. And in essence, it's it's as far as if I would want to go as far away from God's call and what God is calling me to do. And here, in essence, get, getting out of getting out of his presence and being so trying to be so. Hey, I might have other plans over here. I'm going to go over here, and, and maybe God will use somebody else to accomplish his purposes here. I'm I'm unavailable. And and it's it's a ridiculous scenario in that this is an example of how not to go about missions. Well, it was fear. I mean, fear stands for fear of everything at once. I mean, he was fearful of what the world, as he viewed it, was going to do to him. Yeah. He wasn't fearful of God's wrath. Yeah. He. Yeah, that's the thing. Yeah. He was. Yeah. He was. He was comfortable in his in his disobedience, and we're going to see that here. But he was. He was fearful. How'd you say that? You said he was fearful of. He was fearful of the nature of the world, but he was not fearful of God's wrath. He. He did not. He did not fear his father. Yeah. 
Yeah, he because he, he knew he knew God's going to bring this about, and there was something there was a hardness of his heart that that he did not want to see. He'd rather die, mm-hmm. you know, see later than than see these people come. And the other thing is, back in the day, if he showed up and proclaimed, pro, proclaimed God's name like God was telling him to do, there was a good chance that we're going to stone him to death. Yeah, there were a good chance they were going to crucify him. I mean, there were, there were a bunch of scenarios back in the day that people were more afraid of. Yeah, to follow God's word than to actually, you know, they were more afraid of what the consequences would be. They didn't really look that far into it. Yeah, yeah. And on the on the flesh and the with the, the fleshly eyes, you would see that there's there would be total opposition mm-hmm. to this. But like we said, with God, all things are possible. The the what you don't think is possible here, He's bringing that about through the miracle of salvation. And it goes back to God is bringing a people to himself. The eternal plan here of redemption. And I want to take, I want to take you to a portion of scripture in John 17, verse 6. And here you have the heart of our Lord. In John 17, 6. And here you, you enter into an an inter-Trinitarian prayer and communion. And here you have Christ speaking to the Father. He says, I have manifested your name, your name, God. I have manifested your name to the men who, whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me. And they have kept your word. They have been obedient to your word. Now they have come to know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words which you gave me, I have given to them, and they received them, and truly understood that I came forth from you. And they believed that you sent me. And here in, in this, this is what we call the high priestly prayer in John 17. You, you have the heart of Christ and, and a communion here in the, in the Trinity, a communion of that they are one. And, and these people that God has given to him, they are his. He says, I have manifested your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world, the men that you gave me. God's people, that he is redeeming, he is bringing a people to himself. And if you are in Christ tonight, you are part of that, what we call the the true church. You are his, and you are are safe in his hand. He foreknew you from the foundations of the earth, knowing everything about you before it says that he knew your unformed substance knowing the, the hairs on your head, the intricacies of all of your body, and the, what, what do you need to live, because he is the life giver. And seeing the beauty of this, and, and knowing that that point that he is calling you to himself from the time that you heard the, his truth of his word. And he's bringing his people to himself, just as he is, as he is, was doing there in Nineveh, and as he's doing today. God has his people. And you're going to see this here. He has his people all over. His people in Bucks County. He has his people in Pennsylvania, in the U.S., and in the, all the regions of the world. There are those that will come to faith in Christ because he has foreordained it. And he will accomplish his purposes here, whatever it takes. And you're going to see as we go through this book of Jonah here, he is sovereign over everything. He's appointing the fish. He's appointing the the weather. He's appointing the worm. He's appointing the plant to grow. He's sovereign over every single thing. And he's sovereign over everything in your life. And everything that was orchestrated to, if you are in Christ, to bring you to faith in Christ. And if you have not yet, that time that you would bringing all of this about. 
And it's the heart and the love of the Father to bring about this eternal plan of redemption. And that he has allowed this to go on. He allows the unbeliever to live in sin, maybe for 20 years. But that person that you think would never come to faith in Christ and his sovereign purposes, he brings. That he would be glorified, that it's none of the sinner and it's all of God. Just as in Nineveh, there is nothing that they wanted to do in themselves here to turn to God, but God is bringing them through his power of his word. And that's how you have come to faith in Christ. You've heard his word, the gospel, and believed. And that's why we say his word is power, because his word gives life. Righteousness revealed. And the heart here in the in the, this communion here, you have Christ and the Father here. You have, I, he says, I have manifested your name. I have manifested your name, God, to the men whom you gave me out of the world. You gave them to me. And they were yours, because Christ and the Father are one. And you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. I mean, they have believed and they have obeyed your word. Now they have come to know everything that you have given me is from you. For the words which you gave me, I have given to them. And they received them and truly understood them, that I came forth from you, and they believed that you sent me. And here he says, I ask on their behalf, you have Christ here asking on the believer's half and behalf. I do not ask on behalf of the world, but of those whom you have given me, my people. They are yours, and all things that are mine are yours, and yours are mine. And seeing that you are safe as in Christ, you are his. says you have given the god the father has given them to christ and they are they're his and all things that are mine are yours and yours are mine the beauty of that here seeing that and the security of the believer the, the one that is in christ and i want you to see that here that that this is true in our own lives in our personal testimony our personal conversion of salvation and you have this or being orchestrated here to bring these people to salvation in nineveh Sounds personal. Yeah. It's just, it's just that blows my mind. Like, regardless of how people are against him, he yeah. still wants to reach out. Yeah. Gosh. Yeah. It's, yeah, and it's... it's the, personal. I mean, just it's, the, it's, 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 it's the, the... And, and it, what happens is it puts his, his, his love, his mercy, his glory on display in that, that it, is, it is all his working. Mm -hmm. He would have done on anybody that falls. Yeah. And this is this is the, the heart here of the Father to bring the those that are his to himself. And this divine call here to use Jonah, and we're gonna see how how outstretched and how sovereign God is up, upon everything here to bring this about, even in one prophet's disobedience. <laughs> because it all the more it puts God's glory on display and his mercy and his patience it says but jonah rose up to flee to tarshish from the presence of the lord here to to go opposed to where god was telling him to go so he went down to joppa found a ship which was going to tarshish paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to tarshish and as we see on the map here that is the farthest way of, of, from where god is asking him to go Seeing he, he intentionally here is going opposed to God. And he's committed here. He has investments. He paid the fare. He has, is committed to going the opposite direction here. And seeing the... If I was outlining this here, you have overarching all of this is God's reason to bring this about. 
his eternal and divine plan here to bring about the salvation of his people. And you have Jonah's response here, the disobedience. And here you have the result. Here, verse 4, he says, The Lord hurled the great wind on the sea. And there was a great storm on the sea, so that the ship was about to break. And you see God's sovereignty here over the weather. Hurling here. In essence, it would be a, a throwing. To, to, the, the word there is to pierce through, as, as if I'm throwing something. Hurling here, the wind on the sea. And there was a great storm on the sea, so that the ship was about to break up, to be obliterated here. Then the sailors became afraid. And here, these sailors were also opposed to God. I want you to see this here. God's sovereignty here. The, the, uh, the ship being appointed here and the sailors that Jonah is going to go on this ship here, they are opposed to God. They are pagan, worshiping pagan gods. These sailors here became afraid and every man cried to his God here. And you see a picture of polytheism, multiple gods. And the idea is there, if there's, if there's seven sailors, this one has his God and this one has his God and this one has his God and this God. And you have an idea here of, and you see polytheism, false gods. I uh, had a customer who was um, Hindu the other day, and I, I, I actually took a picture of his because they have their gods in their car. And I'm, I'm looking at this, and I'm like, There's, they're, they're attributing a divine being to this little thing. I don't know if it's plastic or ivory or what it, what it is, but um, seeing that here from, as a believer, the silliness of that, putting, putting my faith in, in an idol, a god. Well, the Romans, they had multiple gods, just, yeah. and they would pray to, you know, all the Egyptians, as a matter of fact, that comes to mind, they had to pray to different gods, because when the plague was coming yeah. upon them, or even when the a river went to blood, and they were trying to do a ritual to purify it, and, and, and yeah. they couldn't do anything. Yep. Yeah, the little 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 G. Yeah. Little G. Little G's four of us. Maybe how many of them have. <laughs> it says here, every every one of them cried to his God. In the time of distress here, you have the world. You have the sailors here, and you have the world here seeking everything opposed or everything that is not the true one true God. You have them seeking every every other outlet, every other God. And their action here, they threw, they threw the cargo which was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them, attempting in their flesh to save themselves. He says here, but Jonah had gone below into the hold of the ship, laying down and fallen asleep. Disobedient Jonah, sinning Jonah, comfort in his, com comforted in his sin, able to sleep in the midst of the storm. I put here, sin hardens the heart numbs the conscience even as a believer if i'm being disobedient to the things of god i have a hardened heart a numbed conscience to the reality of what's going on sleeping in the bottom of the boat here so the captain approached him and said how is it that you are sleeping do you see what's going on here how are you sleeping get up Call on your God. Perhaps your God will be concerned about us so that we will not perish. And here you have the call of the, the heathen for, to have Jonah call upon his God, the one true God. And God orchestrating this, bringing about, working upon the sailors' lives. Here to, that you're going to see they're going to come to faith in Christ. These heathen sailors. And this is not by accident. This is a sovereign call of God. And there's so much packed in here. I want you to see God's hand upon everything. There's nothing that is left outside of his hand. And as you go about your life here too, today, and as we step forth from here, realizing that there's nothing that is outside of his hand, and there's no accidents that are going on. But it's all to accomplish his purposes here. 
God is sovereign over all men, all nature, every aspect of nature. He's sovereign over it all. He's sovereign over the salvation of men, bringing people to himself, the people that do not know him, but tomorrow will come to faith in Christ. He sees it from before the beginning of the world. And that's why we are obedient as, why we would share the gospel of John, why we would go out and proclaim truth. Because you are, the heart of the Father here is to use his people that he may bring his people to him. Those that are outside the kingdom, that they may come into the kingdom, that their, book, their name may be written in the book of life. And seeing his arm and his hand outstretched and how this was evident in our own lives. Maybe in our own testimony, we ran for a period of years outside of God. And if we were to die, we would have been eternally outside the kingdom. But it's God's grace and his mercy, his hand open stretched, bringing you all the way through here. That, that, that person shared that gospel of John with me. That person proclaimed the truth to me. And I was once dead, but now I'm alive. And how would I go about living my life now? Here, I do not want to live it for this world because he has redeemed me. Now, I live for him because he has brought this about. And seeing this here, and seeing that he has his people still, he has his people at the target over here. He has his people and. Ben Salem in Philadelphia, in, in California, in, in Africa. You, you see he has his people. And this is the greatest, I would say, the greatest missions book. Uh, and the explanation of how not to do it. But God gets his work done. God gets his work done in his sovereign plan, his sovereign timing. And seeing this as you are looking out in the world... You have seven, eight, almost eight billion people in the world here now, and he has his people, his remnant. And may he use us here now as those that are him, in him, that we may proclaim truth. And God, through the power of his word, will bring his people to himself. Just as he sees that 120,000 in Nineveh and the nation here that would be opposed to him, God's going to bring it about. And praying that souls would be delivered. Why else would I want to live here? Why else, why else would he continue to give us breath and life? It's, it's all to accomplish his purposes because he is life. And everything outside of him is, doesn't exist, is, is, is death. But he has overcome that. He has overcome and he gives life and he gives life that is eternal that never ends and the heart of the father here is that he wants all to have this life and may it be our heart here that when i'm seeing somebody in any interaction or i see someone else online or something in another country i i want to see that they would have this life as well i want them to live as i know outside of him they are outside they are going to die and die a second death of eternal condemnation and this motivates us to here proclaim the truth as we go forth and seeing god will sovereignly bring people into your midst and use you as he is working in your life i want to we'll do a few more verses here and then we'll wrap this up guys I want you to see this here, this, this, this sale that God, in the midst of Jonah's disobedience, using this prophet, this disobedient prophet, that nobody, nobody, nobody remembers aside from the story. They said, when he was, they said no, no prophet came out of Galilee. <laughs> they, they forgot about him. He's not, in, he's not in the Hall of Faith in, in Hebrews. But God here using this to accomplish his purposes. And may this be a lesson to us here of how not to go about it. And may I walk in obedience to God's will. 
and obedience to his word and that he would accomplish his divine purposes. And even the sailors here, the, the heathen sailors, you're going to see this here. It's a beauty of his sovereign, sovereignty to bring them to salvation. They repent and come to faith. <laughs> and, see, and you have them saved and delivered. And, and I'd like to think that they go proclaim the truth to where they're going in Tarshish. And then God brings um, Jonah back to proclaim to Nineveh. And, and God is sovereign over all of this. So, and, and it's a beautiful picture here. And I trust that this speaks to your heart here and, and that you see here that, that I am in control of very little. But here, God is bringing about everything. And Jonah here, even in his disobedience, God uses him. And God will use you. Not that you would be glorified, but that God would be get all the glory. And that's why even in the, the sinners that are appear to be farthest away from him, God is glorified through the salvation of men. Maybe there's a, a murderer on death row who nobody thinks is that they think he's just gonna be um, have the death penalty and that's it. But God's worth there there's a there's a chaplain in the in the prison, and and God's bringing this about here. This this person went 40 years without the Lord, and and has lived a heinous life. But God brings about this chaplain here that He saved, and brings this person here, and and there, right before, two days before execution, this person comes to faith in Christ. I know somebody seeing that, and that's that's an example there. And the maybe there's a a, a, a businessman. Life is good here. No need for God. But God orchestrates events in that person's life, maybe to bring them to the end of self, realizing that you're in control of very little of your business enterprises. And God might bring you to that person to proclaim the truth to them. Yeah. And seeing this here. You mentioned, I mean... There was a guy by the name of uh, Tex Watson who was in um, Charles Manson's family and yeah. he ended up in prison. Well, I found out later on, Tex Watson got saved in a prison chapel and he's yeah. now the prison's living chapel. He's now yeah. actually in the ministry. Yeah. And, uh, and it can't be explained apart from a work, work, work of God. Those that are in Nineveh in this story here, and, and and he says here, and it's the compassion and the graciousness of God, as he says there at the end to Jonah. He says, "And should I not have compassion on Nineveh? Shouldn't I have compassion on the murder on death row? Shouldn't I have compassion on this person in Bucks County? Shouldn't I have compassion here? The the heart and the love of God, so that arm outstretched, because." I have my people and I'm accomplishing my purposes that I would be glorified because it's all about him. And as in Romans 11 talks about all things are from him and all things are to him. You know what Jesus saw, uh, I'm going to do a test of it now, because what's revealed in the old, yep. shown in the old, revealed in the new, I'll get that backwards. When they're in the boat with Jesus and they're sinking. Mm -hmm. And he's sleeping down in the well with like Jonah sleeping down there and they're coming down. And I'm not saying Jonah is Jesus. I'm yeah. just embarrassing. But it's about faith. And he says, Ye of little faith, he calms the seas. Jonah is thrown out naturally. Mm -hmm. So he's calmed down. He's swallowed by a big fish. Yeah. Three days, three nights. That's the resurrection. Yeah. And it's amazing how they. So it's the, pretty powerful. The sign. Yeah. But Jonah is powerful. You know, yeah. This is the powerful. Yeah. There's a lot of yeah. wild stuff going on. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing, man. Amazing amazing story. And you see, um here I want to read this this um one of the passages here in Romans. 
that this is not the only example of God having his God having, God having his people. In in Romans 11 Paul's speaking about Israel here. He says, "I say then, God has not rejected his people, has he?" Speaking of of Israel. God has not left them. God has not rejected his people. May it never be. For I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah? How he pleads with God against Israel? Elijah saying, Lord, they have killed your prophets. They have torn down your altars and I alone am left and they are seeking my life. But what is the divine response to him? God says, I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not yet bowed the knee to Baal. I have my people. Regardless of what you see going on, Elijah. I have my people. I have kept for myself, because they're mine, 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. And, and you see this, he's quoting back to the Old Testament in this context. In the same way, then, there has also come to be at the present time the remnant according to God's gracious choice. God choosing, God sovereign over this because he's God. And he is, they're his, and he's bringing this about. This was the remnant. Mis misinterpret that, saying God's choosing people and choosing people to go to hell. But I don't think people understand that. Yeah. You know, they, they try to turn that around to try to make it look like, well, he's picking and choosing. Okay, you go and you're not. You're going, you're not. They, I think yeah. people think that, but it, yeah. No, I had to understand that because I've always yeah. thought, you know, well, why would he do that? It didn't yeah. make sense until I got. Yeah, there's, 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 there's God's, God's foreknowledge, God's just choice, but then you have man's responsibility, and and these, these two things yeah. going together here. He's at everything there before you. It's just not yeah. you choosing. Yeah. Can and, you think of modern day bells with portion today? I I would say um so this I would I would I would say that's that's an element of the work of the enemy. Yeah. The enemy. yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, here this would be in essence um, the the bowing and the kissing to the the word there is 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 in essence kissing the the one that is opposed to God. So this this would represent the 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 anything that is outside God and, and Christ. So he, here in this sense in this context here, it's Baal would be the element of what we would call the Antichrist because it is opposed to Christ. And here bowing the knee of uh, a sign of worship and the word there is, is kissing in essence mm -hmm. in another passage it talks about you know, where you're, you're on the flip side of that <clears throat> worshiping and, and do homage to the to the son christ kiss the son in essence that it's, it's a, you have the, the distinction there it represents the gentiles yeah. too that, that, how, how, that the opposing god yeah you see here, he 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 has his people here, and this is why, even on the surface here, in, in this in this sense, it's because of those seven thousand, that, that remnant. And I want you to see this here as you go forth, as you as you have the vision of your life and, and your day to day here. You're not just going around Bucks County, but there's there's a, there's God has his people, and they they don't know him yet. And this is where the the evangelistic call of this. This missions call. This is the greatest missions, in my opinion, the greatest missions book, because you see here God's people, and realizing God's orchestrating all the events to come together. And this here, realizing God's sovereign over everything. But here I'm going to go out and proclaim. I'm going to be obedient. I'm going to go forth. I'm going to call everybody to come in here, as we talked about before, the, into the ark, into the salvation, because I want them to be saved. I want them to have life. Mm -hmm. And may we not do it as, as Jonah has done. May I see that, Lord, this life that you've given me, that you've delivered me from, my the wrath of my sin, my penalty of sin, you worked on my behalf to bring about my salvation. Lord, I want to I wanna reach everybody I can. I'm not going to be ashamed of the gospel, as Paul says, because there's nothing to be ashamed of 
because it's everything is for you, God. And nothing could be ashamed. The world may be, I'm not seeking the approval of men. Lord, I'm seeking your approval and your, your love, your mercy, your grace upon my life to live and breathe, to work, do your work, but also that th those would come to know you, all that are yours, <coughs> the remnant. And it's your heart, Father, here that you would bring them to yourself because you are a compassionate, a graces, a merciful God. And yes, you do have compassion, Lord, on Nineveh, the great city in which you have your people, more than 120,000. And the, the picture there is, the, we're going to look to it, the younger individual, those that do not have the, know they're left from the right here, seeing that there's a generation to come, their children here, that they may know God. And seeing God's working all this out. And it's a beautiful thing. Let's wrap up, guys. And thank you for sticking with me. And I just want us to see, and, and words are not enough, but to, I want you to see the, the beauty of what God is doing here in this story and how this conviction here of our heart as we look to this tonight that it's would reap eternal fruit as you go forth from here that it's not just something that's a one-off but that this would have an impact for eternity let's pray dear only father we uh, thank you for this this time to to come together tonight or with the men here to be back in, with the Bible study here, to look towards your word, Lord God. And your word gives life. And I pray that, Lord, that you would bring your people here to the, the people, that, that you would bring the people that do not know you yet to these guys, Lord, that they may proclaim, not themselves, but your truth of your word, of your saving gospel, Lord, that these people may come to know you. Because it's all about that. Because you, everything is about you. And the people here, Lord, that God has given to you. And the beauty of that, Lord. The communion, that face-to-face -face here of that you, that we will see God because we are yours. We have a foretaste of that here. And we want other people to have that foretaste, Lord, that they, upon their last breath, that they would be instantly in your presence. And may we learn from Jonah how not to go about it, but may we be obedient to your word and to your divine call to accomplish your divine purposes. And may we be aware, aware of this as we go forth tonight, and we pray all things in your name. Amen. 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 So, Amen. Right, guys. so anyway, yeah. um,